Hello. We're going to be talking about um, movies that are about design. There was a time when uh, I remember designers sitting around saying, if only someone would make a really good movie about what we did that would explain it you know, to regular people, that would make all the difference, right? And uh, we have now movies like that, and, uh, I, and I think it is making a bit of a difference. And we're very fortunate uh, uh, to have three really, really talented filmmakers who have uh, devoted uh, those talents to bringing design and design thinking, design history, and the possibilities of design to a larger public through the uh, medium of film. And uh, each of them are here to uh, talk a little bit about their work, show you a sample of some of the stuff they've done, and then we can talk a little bit at length about uh, you know, what motivates them, how they came to do this stuff. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, start with uh, birthday boy, gentleman, Eames Demetrius. Uh, Eames is, uh, as you heard, um, you know, uh, comes truly out of the world of design uh, by uh, not just by uh, uh, background, but by birthright, is uh, grandparents. Uh, Charles and Ray Eames are two of, are, uh, by some accounts, the two most important uh, American design figures of the uh, 20th century. And uh, my first question, Eames, would be, um, uh, what led you into the world of film? Well, I always, I always, um, always, always liked uh, filmmaking. I made films from when I was about 10. Me and the kids in the neighborhood uh, had a uh, little group called 20th Avenue Fox, and we would make little <laughs> short, short films. And, uh, and then we, uh, and then in my senior year in high school, I saw about 500 films, so which is amazing. That, but it was when you could see them all in movie theaters too. So it was really, it was San Francisco is a great, great city for that. So I, I always kind of had thought of myself as a filmmaker, and actually feel like I kind of got into the design thing backwards because I didn't really expect to, um, to, there was no sense of, oh, you know, we're going to take care of the, the, I mean, if you had met Ray, she had that feeling that she would live forever, so of course one never thinks about those things, and then she died quite suddenly, and then I realized that, that there were things that I cared about, um, that or we all cared about as a family, that would go away if we didn't put some attention to it. Uh, and, uh, and Charles and Ray, of course, were incredibly talented filmmakers mm -hmm. themselves, and uh, I don't know if uh, how many of you are familiar with some of their films, but they were pioneers at really using multimedia and different media, including film, to explain complicated mathematical subjects, all sorts of things that uh, really were groundbreaking in terms of bringing subjects to a greater public. How many of you have seen a film called Powers of Ten? It's nine minutes long, and it basically starts at a picnic, zooms out to the edge of the universe, goes back to the picnic and into an atom in the guy's hand all in one shot. And it's really, in this day and age, I think it's a very important film because I think a lot of the problems the, the planet is facing are problems of scale. And I think if we don't understand scale, we can't really be good citizens of the world. So I think it's a, um, it, you know, it's a very, very important idea. And I think that the, the thing for designers, though, and I think... One of the things that Charles and Ray did is that they never delegated understanding. They never had somebody else explain, figure it out, and then they made it pretty. You know, they, the powers of ten film in Hollywood. There's something called the. How many saw Men in Black? Okay, good. All right, that says a little something, but it's true in every audience. Um, remember the very end shot when it kind of zooms out, you know, from the little galaxy around the neck of the. Remember? Well, in Hollywood, that's called the powers of ten shot because it's inspired by the Eames film Powers of Ten. But when Charles and Ray made the film, they didn't hire a film crew to make it. It was designers in the office making it. And that's what I mean by not delegating understanding. Because only if you do the doing can you get the learning from it. Yeah, in terms of the doing that, in terms of the doing that you've done, you mm -hmm. want to talk about, uh, you know, um, how you developed as a filmmaker and uh, show us some of your work? I I'd love to. And I, um, you know, I, what I like in filmmaking is I like. Uh, I really enjoy um, helping people understand their own stories better. And sometimes I do that for a company, sometimes I do that for um, just a, a place that I'm exploring. One of the film, I'm only, the film I'm gonna show just now is a clip from a film that I did about Charles and Ray, because I really felt that that was some, it, was, it felt the most appropriate. But one of the films that we're showing at the festival is a film called Lucy's House, which is about the rural studio um, program started by um, Samuel Mockby. And, um, but what was nice about, about that film is it's only 15 minutes long. So design teachers or people can use it, and it can be more of a provocation. Um, and uh, you know, the, we, when you do a feature film, there can be a really in-depth investigation. But sometimes for a teacher, it's really great just to have that, I, the germ of the idea. I've done um, 
I also, I've done films not related to design. I'm working, uh, I did one on the modern Maya of southern Mexico. I did um, a really, a, a project I can't believe I did, which is I interviewed the same 28 people every three weeks for a whole year to take a, I actually have 5% of the running time of 1988 on, on tape. It was kind of sort of crazy, but, um, but it was right really about how we learn about ideas in the, in the uh, media age. So I've always tried to do things where I can um, uh, do, it, do it myself to some degree and have the uh, creative independence to explore it the way it should go. So if we um, want to see a little bit of, uh, of the need, you need to describe what's, what, yeah, let me, what let me you're going to show? Yeah, I'm going to show you a film. I was trying to think about what to show uh, in this clip, and I'm a firm believer that design is a willingness to surrender to the journey. And, and I so I thought, well, I'll, I'll in a way show the film that started my journey with design, which is that when, when Ray died, um, and I mean, it'll be in the, in the introductory narration, um, we basically found out we had six months to uh, empty the Eames office in, uh, in Santa Monica. And actually what happened is that my mom went down and said um, to the build because it was con about to be condemned for earthquake reasons, because it, uh, it was a, you know, a masonry, unreinforced masonry building in, uh, in, um, in Los Angeles, which is earthquake country. And so my mom said, well, you know, Rames just passed away, and uh, you know, can, um, we have about two years to close. And they, I, they said, are you kidding? That old lady's been sweet talking us for years from not condemning that place. You got six months, which in some ways was a mercy, mercy because we really had to deal with it. But I mean, almost immediately I had to start filming and capturing it because it was just a very magic place. I, you know, it was such a great place to go as a kid. It was literally like Alice in Wonderland. You went through the looking glass and you, um, I know that's two different books, but anyway, you go through the looking glass and, uh, and um, you know, you were in, the, in this other world of amazing project. Plus there was a whole surreal thing there that they, you know, people think about design spaces as sort of, you know, fully expressed visual designs, but for the Charles and Ray, the most important thing was flexibility. And in fact, even the walls were only clamped in. So sometimes we'd go down there and we'd look, you know, and two months later it looked totally different because they'd moved everything around. It's very, very interesting. Um, so the film, the film uh, we're going to see is that we're just going to watch the first, you know, four minutes of the film. Um, and uh, it'll give you a sense of uh, that. So if we could uh, cue that up. On August 21st, 1988, designer Ray Eames died, 10 years to the day after the death of her husband, architect Charles Eames. Following her plans, 901 Washington Boulevard, their workplace for 45 years, was sold and its contents dispersed by the family to museums and other institutions according to her wishes. But first, we made this record of the marvelous world Charles and Ray designed within 901 and the process of closing it. In 1943, Charles and Ray moved their shop into this old garage in Venice, California. Here they designed furniture, toys, games, graphics, showrooms and shows, made over 100 films, shot stills, wrote books, initiated studies like the India Report, created museum exhibitions, and more. Sam Pasolacqua, staff member for 22 years.
The musical towers were a toy idea that Eames has developed in the late 50s. Often the first task of an intern would be to rearrange the keys for a new tune. Ray's eye and memory for color and shape were legendary. From the start, much of her work was done here in the graphics room, one of the original three rooms of the office of Charles and Ray Eames. So when, when we were kids, we would, could get about 40 of those marbles going at one time. So it was never clear to me how anybody got any work done when we were, when we were visiting. But I think that it also kind of related to, to what, what Harry was talking about um, and or some, some of his journey because whenever they explored things, they always tried to come from a pure place. So that musical tower was originally something that was going to go in the time life lobby um, because it was, a, it was a great way to show that the laws of physics always work. Um, but then in the end, there were so many logistical problems that are to have it in a public space all the time that it just, it, it wasn't appropriate. So it wasn't a failure. It was just a design journey that, you know, didn't, that didn't pay off in the public sense, but then they kept it in, in the office. And, um, and so that's, that, that I think that as beautiful as all the objects that they designed are, it's the ideas behind them that are, that are, that are even more important. And that's kind of what we, we do at the office is try to get that across. Yeah, and, um uh, as, as you designers, as the designers and the artists looked at that image, I wonder if you felt as I did that you know, although um, uh, that office was at that address from what date to what date? From 19, yeah, from 1943 to 1988 when Ray died. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, you're looking at something that really is, um, you know, in a way a historical record of design practice in, uh, in the rapidly receding mid-20th mm -hmm. century, but um, I'm guessing that it it looked more familiar to you than you'd expect. I mean, somehow the design process mm -hmm. entails that sort of accumulation of inspirational objects, the, the evidence of uh, experiments successful mm -hmm. and failed all over the place. And uh, occasionally I see a, a design studio that's pristine, clean, and stripped bare. Uh, but um, more often than not, they, the, the ones in 2010 will look more like that than, uh, than not, I think. You know? and, and let me just add to that, that the important thing is that, you know, what I said about Powers of Ten, that they made it themselves. Well, now we call that desktop publishing, you know, and, and ba you know, they had a, they had a um, you know, full photo, black and white color lab, and a black and white photo lab and a color lab. Well, you know, now that's all Photoshop. But the point is not, it, the, the point of that is that, they made the tools that they needed to achieve. They basically anticipated a lot of this desktop publishing world. So the point is really that it's the vision that matters. Then you can find the the, the toolkit um, that goes with it. And I just wanted to say uh, two other things um, that may come across a bit in that um, before we um, hear from the other film, the the other folks, which is that Charles Murray used to say, and this is something that's come back to me as I've heard uh, heard um, the speakers. Charles Murray used to say that the role of the designer is basically that of a good host anticipating the needs of the guest. And I think it's a really powerful idea as we start to try to, you know, reframe whether this, you know, less is more, from false, you know, how we're going to get in there. It's also a very, you know, cross-cultural thing. I have not been to a place on the, in the world where there's not a responsibility of the host to the guest. You know, in India, they have this, um, this proverb, the guest is God, you know. And, and the other thing is that there's always this tendency to, to kind of do an either-or thing. And, you know, Charles once said that the extent to which you have a design style is the extent to which you have not solved the design problem. Somebody said that the Eames office, that it was, it was not a, uh, there was no design style, but a legacy of problems well solved. And I think, if we can, I think a lot of this conference is about getting back to that definition of design, because that's the one that I think can um, really help the world. And that's the one that's been going on for thousands of years in vernacular design. It's just that with design by designers, we accelerate it a bit. Well, speaking of problems well solved, uh, I saw um, um, our next uh, uh, filmmaker, Doug Prey's film, Art and Copy, um, back in November, and was really, uh, uh, although I, I, I'm, um, I'm sort of an insider because I'm a, uh, a designer and I know the world of advertising, and uh, I thought, you know, well, 
when I when I sat down to watch it, I thought, well, I know this stuff already. You know, I've been I've been reading and living this world for you know my whole career, and it's full of surprises, particularly about the making of advertising that we see every day, what motivates the creative people, how they came to do it, and those insights, I think, were things that are, for the most part, completely fresh and quite startling. Doug, can you talk about how you came to make that film? Um, I was approached by a few producers who, who, all documentaries are about access to stories, and it was actually really simple. The One Club in New York had access to these 11 or 12 individuals who were kind of legendary, all legendary names in advertising, people like Dan Wyden, and, uh, who, who did all of Nike's advertising, among many other things, um, and Lee Clow, who introduced Apple to the world in 1984 and still does today, uh, Mary Wells, um, who's known in the 60s, and a, a group of people who were inspired by what they call the creative revolution of the 1960s. So it was one of those simple things, it's like, oh, wow, I would love to inter you know I'd love to meet these people and hear what they have to say. I wasn't looking at it as a history, and I certainly wasn't looking at it as a case by case study of oh let's get into the details of this. And so my film uh, approaches advertising as a generalist. It's sort of in a, in a general way, but hopefully in an inspiring way because it's really about taking risks and this these simple ideas that. It's sort of like really, when advertising is done really well, it actually can be incredibly inspiring. It actually can be uplifting. If we have to live with advertising in a world of commerce, why can't it be better? Which seems to be the theme of the entire conference. So when I first heard that they wanted to show the film here, I thought, you know, it's not really about design specifically, but, but it absolutely rings true to what I think is trying to be said here that, you know, if there's humanity and truth in a good campaign, it actually is not a bad thing. It's, it's okay. It's not about the product. It's about how are you doing that job and how does your doing of that job affect the people who are receiving it. Um, you have an uh, example of a clip you want to show us? Um, well, I was going to show, uh, a, I have two clips if it's okay. I was going to show a short, uh, just little preview of the film so you get an idea of kind of what it's like. So if we could run the first, that'd be great. The frightening and most difficult thing about being what somebody calls a creative person is that you have absolutely no idea where any of your thoughts come from, really. I think there's always an innate human urge to put something out there and see what people are going to make of it. We're doing exactly the same thing as the guys that were painting on caves. I think what you can do is manufacture any feeling that you want people to have. I was born, as a number of people in advertising, with a gift for sensing what it is that will turn you on. I think creativity can solve anything. 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 a lot of documentaries in my life about artists and sort of maverick people. I've made movies about rock subcultures and hip-hop DJs and graffiti artists, and I tried to approach this in the same way, of sort of not being judgmental, because advertising is a very difficult thing to make films about, because it's so hated. And I really agree, I mean, and I do too. I think we all hate bad advertising. You know, and if 98% of all advertising is bad, the theory of this film is kind of like, well, can, you know, like I said earlier, can we make better advertising? And so I'm going to just preface that I'm going to show you a clip from the movie that is actually, um, it's, it's basically George Lois, who's kind of one of the legendary 60s. I guess you could almost call him a real madman, although my movie has nothing to do with the TV series Mad Men, if anybody's seen that. Um, 
it, but he is, he is from that era when, in the 60s, when advertising was really exciting. And to him, he felt strongly that you can use advertising to be revolutionary. You can use it to be subversive. You can use it to challenge the status quo. And what I'd like you to think about when you watch this next clip isn't the fact that it's about Tommy Hilfiger. It's not about the clothing. I, you know, my interest isn't in the product in this film or in this next scene. It's about a few things that are really, really extraordinary about what he did and what I think a lot of the people in my film did that is actually different from all the other 98% of advertising. And that is, number one, the way they did their campaign was very much a part of their personality. So you'll see that it's a very punch you in the face kind of campaign. And if you know anything about George Lois, which you learn in the film, he grew up on the streets of, of the Bronx and he grew up fighting kids all the time. And all of his campaigns are like that. They're kind of, they are him. They are his personality. And that's something I'd never realized about advertising is that good advertising might actually reflect the personality of its creator, just like a good film or a book or anything else. The second thing is what I've already mentioned, but just this idea of you can make campaigns that in their own way are subversive or kind of challenging the status quo. So that'll be very evident in what he did. And I think the most interesting thing about uh, just this scene and, and some other stuff in the movie is when you can actually find evidence of, ad of the communication itself improving the product. When you can actually make an argument, and when, when can you ever do this when you're talking about advertising and you know, the world, when you could actually say that ad campaign made the product better and maybe made people's lives like this much better. Like I don't really care about jeans so much, but if the clothes are better, then they're better than not better clothes. That's all. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say. And um, so I hope you enjoy it and come see the whole film if you like it. And uh, yeah. I can make Tommy Hilfiger famous and important brand you know, in uh, a couple hours, you know. He is a visionary. He sees things normal people don't see. And he thinks about what they want to see before they know what they want. He had just recently developed the uh, launch ads for MTV. And he developed this advertising campaign to introduce an unknown to the world of fashion overnight. And he did it. He said, I've got an idea. Why don't we put a picture of Ralph Lauren? He's an old guy with white hair. Calvin Klein, looks a little craggy. And uh, maybe Halston, he's dead. And then we'll say, you're the next. And I said, well, you can't compare me to Ralph Lauren and Calvin Klein. I mean, I can't compare myself. It'll sound like I'm bragging or something. You know, I like to view myself as looking at those guys as the gods. So I, I show him an ad and it says, uh, the four great American designs for men are, and then it said C dash dash dash. You know, you had to fill in the name. Uh, Calvin Klein. And I don't want R dash. You know, Ralph Lauren. P dash dash dash. Perry Ellis. Then it said T dash dash dash. H dash 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 dash. You know, who the hell knew who T H was? It's Tommy's mother didn't know. I don't want any part of this. Of course, Tommy saw it and almost had a heart attack. So I can't do that. He sat me down and said, "Listen, if you." want to have any name recognition in this business at all. You need millions of dollars worth of advertising over and over and over and over, and it'll take you years. If you want your name to be known right away and people to go and look at your clothes, we need something unique like this. I always use the term seemingly outrageous. You should look at something and think it's a little crazy, and in the next two or three or four seconds or 20 seconds, you realize, wow, it's on the nose. You know, but, but the product better be damn good. Because if the product that isn't any good, I'll put it out of business. Because people would want to buy it if I had a piece of shit. I had sleepless nights because I was thinking this is gonna, you know, this is gonna be the end of my career. And then and every once in a while I would think, but maybe the name will become known. People will look at the clothes and like the clothes. The ads ran, people went crazy. <laughs> All of 7th Avenue said, who does he think he is? He's no designer. Ralph and Calvin have been working years and years and years. He was on the Johnny Carson show the week after I ran here. I said, it's not a campaign I dreamed up myself. 
It was a, a, a campaign Mr. George Lois dreamed up and convinced my business partner we should run. It was not my choice to run this campaign. And I am a struggling designer, and I hope for the best with my company and my clothes. But I, I've been truly embarrassed by it. And I did a gigantic billboard that said the same words on 7th Avenue to piss off Calvin and Ralph, et cetera. He became famous overnight, literally. But it also drove me into such embarrassment. I rolled up my sleeves and worked harder than I ever thought I'd work. I knew there would be only one way to prove the naysayers wrong, and that would be to come out with amazing clothes. So I literally rolled up my sleeves and worked like an animal, making sure that every button, every zipper, every buttonhole, every color, every fit, every fabric was to perfection. George turbocharged my success, and then it just took off. Then the hip hoppers started wearing, then the rockers, and then the su suburbanites, then the dads and the moms and the kids, and my, my business burst into a multi-billion dollar global business. Great advertising makes food taste better, it makes cars run better, it, 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 it changes the perception of everything. You know, I, you know it, it actually does prove exactly the point that you made about, um, uh, um, you know, Hilfinger himself said, who, by the way, I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but literally, I remember when that campaign came out, no, no one had, he wasn't, he wasn't like a lesser known designer. He was an unknown designer. No one had ever heard of this guy. And the amount of audacity and brazen chutzpah it took to run any of those ads, and the fact that he had plausible deniability and could go on and say, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> it's just fantastic. You know, the whole thing's so diabolical. It's uh, really wonderful. But then it made the, uh, you know, it pushed him to really rise to the occasion. It sort of set a bar for him to come to. So it's pretty remarkable. And uh, the great thing about um, Doug's film is that there's story after story after story like that. One question I have, Doug, is I, I was um, looking online and sort of like looking at reviews of the film, and I noticed one thing over and over again. I think because, as you say, um, people have a tendency to dislike, be suspicious of advertising, and um, this is a film that isn't a, um, you know, a... Uh, an ad busters style critique, right. blanket critique of advertising. It's as you say, a kind of like measured objective view of it. Um, I was uh, sort of surprised at how many reviews I read that kind of took the point of view as I went in to the theater expecting to, uh, you know, I, with my guard up and actually you get disarmed by story after story like this and you get involved with uh, basically the um, uh, the act of people, the act of human beings, the people you've never heard of who've, who've affected your life, kind of taking on these challenges and uh, coming up with something that actually does affect your life in perhaps a positive way. Were you surprised at that reaction? Not at all. I mean, because I, I would have had the same reaction myself probably if I went to see the movie, but it's just because it's expected. If you make a film about advertising, you have to be making a film that's going to totally trash it. And I totally understand where that's coming from, but to me, that's a boring movie. I totally get it. I, you would start the movie and end the movie in the same place. I think if you want to fight advertising, it's much better to get to know the actual human beings who are the geniuses who are actually kind of constructing it and figure it out and then fight it if you want to. But it's, that's just my theory of all my films is I, I tend to... I don't judge. I just, I just, I mean, I, that sounds lame, but I mean, I, I ask, I ask tough questions, but I don't, I don't make the movie for the point of destroying them. Otherwise, why would I make the movie? It's more just, I want to, I want to get to know them and I want to know where are they coming from and learn something from them because they are the greatest communicators there are. They're so efficient at words and graphics. And it's, it's one of the amazing things about advertising is it's just so intense, you know, putting stuff in 30 seconds or on one billboard with a few words is, it's not easy to do, and they are really good at it. So I think as filmmakers, you know, I, I mean, I had a lot to learn from them. <laughs> so. 
Um, Gary. Uh, Gary Huswood has made uh, two uh, acclaimed documentaries, uh, Objectified about the world of product design and Helvetica about um, a typeface that you're probably, that many people here are probably familiar with. Um, I know, I met Gary a few years ago. First, I believe, as I recall by email, I got an email from this guy I'd never heard of saying he was planning to make a documentary about Helvetica. And, you know, could he come and talk to me about it? And I just remember, you know, you get a lot of emails, and this one really sounded, I get some screwy <laughs> emails, and this one sounded like really <laughs> implausible. You know, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, months and months and months go by. I come in, I meet Gary a couple times, and sort of filmed a few times, and then all of a sudden um, uh, we're at the premiere in New York at the Museum of Modern Art, and this, uh, uh, what I think is an extraordinary film about the unlikeliest of subjects actually unspools before everyone's eyes. And uh, I'm in it for a few minutes, and to this day, my entire claim to fame, I, I can visit my uh, son's college campus, and uh, uh, his classmates will stop me, and they say, oh, our professor made, uh, had us watch Helvetica. Or, uh, we, we saw you in Helvetica, Mr. Barut, and they're sort of like all, <laughs> you know, pandering. And I do have an, I'm, I'm listed on your IM, uh, your, your Internet Movie Database page as uh, Michael Barut himself. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's great. So, so it, you know, my mom always told me you have to answer all the mail you get. You know, she does before the age of email. So I, I'm very courteous to answer every email, and that was like one where it really paid off. How, you know, um, how did you decide to uh, make that first movie about Helvetica? Well, it's it's um, you know, it was mostly a movie that I wanted to watch as a as a as a fan of graphic design and sort of a a closet, um, you know, graphic designer um, over the years. I mean, I've never been an actual graphic designer, but I've always sort of um, played around with, with type and with um, design ever since I got my first Mac back in, like, 1988 or something. So um, it's just something I wanted to, I wanted to see, and it, it was something that I, I couldn't believe there wasn't already a film about graphic design and about typography. Um, and I just really wanted to watch it, and, and uh, that's... I think that that's, I guess, sort of my um, my creative process in a nutshell. It's just things that I want to to do or to see or um, to go to that 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 aren't that don't exist, and and I just can't figure out why they don't exist um, to the point where I actually just have to go out and and just you know do it and make it. Yeah, we got into this a little bit with uh, uh, Doug, I think. But um, when you started, when you went in to make the movie, did you expect it to be what it turned out to be? <laughs> Definitely um, not. I, uh, I, you know, it was it was like a a little side project. It was like my my you know, like little uh, uh, a personal film for me to watch. And 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 I think I, I made it just because like I made it the way I would want to see a film about about type. Um, and uh, but but it, it's it's interesting to see there, there's such a there's so many people that are designers and generations of designers and and um, you know, everyone from you know Massimo Vignelli who's here to to young design students and 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 um, yeah I didn't I didn't really expect to uh, to uh, I don't know to have everybody um, you know receive it so 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 warmly but but uh, you want to show um, uh, the trailer oh, yeah, this, uh, if you haven't people, seen it you may get a taste of it yeah I haven't seen either um, Helvetica or Objectified we're just gonna run 90 second trailers uh, uh, for those two, so.
I think you, you said once that in, your original idea would be the whole film would almost be just like that, music and shots of Helvetica and the environment. Yeah, sort of like a, a tone poem about you know, type and, in cities and, and in our daily lives. And then I was thinking maybe I would just interview maybe three or four designers and they would talk like a voiceover over that and maybe you wouldn't even see them. And then, of course, the more I, I got into the project, the more it really became about, about the people um, and all the creativity and all the, the work that goes into the simplest little typeface. And then uh, you followed that up. Oh, actually, and also I never, I just re remembered, I still haven't called that crystal meth number to see what, like, <laughs> to see what it is. I still, I still actually have to do that. I mean, whatever it's still, like, connected or... There's probably a great story there, like, <laughs> how many people call that number from seeing it in the movie? And, not, not necessarily looking for drugs, but just to see, like, <laughs> if it's, like, my number or something. I still, I should, guess I should find out. I bet it's a really coveted mem number in the crystal meth community. They're probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the they're just, like, want, really, exactly. really angry that, uh, at me for doing it. But, um, yeah, but then it, 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 you know, expanded. You followed that up with um, your second uh, documentary on design. Yeah, and I wasn't planning on making a series of, of films about, about design, but after um, I had made Helvetica and went out, I mean, I got to go to 100 cities around the world to show, show the film and meet so many amazing people and have uh, great conversations about design and its role in our lives. And during that kind of um, touring process, I got a lot of ideas about, um, you know, maybe the, doing another film or kind of a, a, it's almost kind of the extension of, of Helvetica in a way, but about um, our manufactured environment and all the kind of objects that we, that, we, uh, that we have and the people who design all this, all this stuff that we surround ourselves with. And that, that was the, the seeds of, um, of Objectified. And um, luckily, a lot of the designers had, had, who I approached about Objectified had already seen Helvetica or, or at least knew about it and, and kind of had a little bit of an idea of what I did. So um, it was a lot easier than my, my uh, random emails to you and <laughs> everyone else for, uh, for Helvetica. But. Yeah, and do we have a trailer for Objectified yeah, we can yeah. look at? Yeah. We can play that. When you see an object, you make so many assumptions about that object in seconds. What it does, how well it's gonna do it, how much you think it should cost. The object testifies to the people that conceived it, developed it, manufactured it. Sometimes we know who these designers are, sometimes we don't. But anything that's touched by man, is transformed by man, is by its very nature design. Ultimately my job as a designer is to look into the future. You know, my job is about what's going to happen, not what has happened. All these physical objects in our lives, there's no real critique on them. Very, very little discussion on how these things really, really affect us. A lot, most of, I mean, the people in this room um, are probably more attuned, but I think most of us are just take, take a lot of things for granted. The, you know, type on billboards or what you're reading or, or the furniture you're, you're, you know, that's around in your house. But um, the amount of decisions that go into the simplest object is just it's staggering. And, and I, I love kind of digging in and finding out that, that, that process and seeing um, the, the genius of these people behind all these designs. And they're unknown. I mean, they are relatively unknown. It's sort of like when I, when I met you a few months ago in preparation, when we heard we were going to come here, and we met, and I, and I sort of was reminded of all the things in my life growing up that the Ames had done, like the, like the Powers of Ten, which was huge if you, you know, if you grew up in the States and kind of went to the Museum of Science and Industry or <laughs> anything like that, and this wall poster, which I had no idea they did, that I had on my wall for many years, and it's sort of on and on, and these cool stacking cards, and 
It, but it was like, they're famous, and they're kind of like rock stars in the world of design, but they're not known outside of that world. And I think that's really intriguing. Like, I was really in, interested in that idea of advertising, too. Like, if you work in the advertising industry, you know the name White and Kennedy, but, but if you don't, nobody knows them. And yet they're kind of captains of industry, and same with the people in your film. Like, they... Like here, these they've made things that I've held on to thousands of times, or touched, or you know, like, and it's, but it's not about their name. They're not doing it for that reason. It's a, it, I find that very interesting. So their fame is kind of fleeting, and it's more about like, how they're affecting you, or well, they're, exactly. you know. I mean, all the all the people that are the subjects of these films. Multiplicity is the essence of, of the work. In other words, there it's not about designing one particular object. It's actually about creating a system that can give that, whether you call it the guest host experience or whatever, you can give it again and again. So it's a very interesting thing. It's and it's I think it's one of the the reasons why people have a real challenge understanding things like um, design authenticity because we have this sort of fine art idea, but there's actually, you know, the 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 objects that the people in your movie were designing are the objects that are made tomorrow. They're not designing like one thing that that goes into the museum. It's like, can you pull it up and can it be validated by the, by the way people use it in the, in the world? And I think that that's sort of um, an, an, an idea that's not self-evident. Yeah, so um, if you're interested in continuing the conversation, each of our filmmakers will be appearing at the film festival. So uh, thank you so much for uh, your attention. Thank you. And see you at the movies. <laughs>